Heavenly Father, it is an immense joy, unspeakable privilege to be called by your name, to be seated at your table, to be in fellowship with you, to be in Christ, to have been crucified with you, Lord Jesus, and to have entered into resurrection life. That life we now live, we live in you. And we're so thankful to be yours. Surely we will sing the thoughts of that song forever and ever and ever in unceasing gratitude for all you have done on our behalf. We thank you even now that we get to come before your word and to be instructed by it. We pray for your help by your Holy Spirit that we might see what you have for us here this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's always good to wait to be invited to something before you just barge in. <clears throat> I turn your attention this morning to the last chapter of the book of Romans. I turn to Romans chapter 16. Some portions of Scripture at times seem to be flyover sections. You ever come to some of those? Maybe some of those genealogies, those long lists of unpronounceable names, or long lists of geographical places you're unfamiliar with. Uh, this morning we come to a list of names and greetings. Is this a flyover section of, of our Bibles? Well, there probably really are no true flyover sections. The Bible itself claims for itself that every portion is profitable for teaching, correcting, reproof, for training in righteousness. And I would encourage you at times to slow down in those genealogies, slow down in those geographical sections. Sometimes we have to get out an encyclopedia and a dictionary and an atlas. But slowing down in those sections yields fruit that we may or may not be aware is there. No difference for us here in this morning as we come to a 16-verse section of Scripture that really could be a 28-point sermon. There is one commendation. There are 27 greetings followed by an encouragement for the church to greet one another. For the sake of simplicity for the people in the booth in the back, we won't do 28 points. We'll boil these down to three. But here we have a commendation of one servant named Phoebe, greetings to 26 individuals, greetings to several groups of people, and an encouragement from Paul that the church, the members of the church, greet one another. That's what this passage is about. And here we come near the end of this letter to Romans, and Paul here expresses love for this church he has never yet visited. At the end of this letter, Paul is manifesting his profound love for this church he's never yet seen, never been to. And he does so in three ways. And we begin, we begin first of all, with this commendation of one particular servant. Let's read together the first two verses. Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church which is at Sencrea that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of, for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. Paul commends this particular servant named Phoebe. The commendation letters were common in the ancient world. If you were traveling to a strange place where you didn't know anybody, it was helpful to carry a letter to the people you would be visiting from someone that they knew that knew you. And a commendation letter would be carried to commend you and your character, your trustworthiness, to the people who would then host you or care for you in some way. Now, traveling in the ancient world was dangerous, and these commendation letters served as something of a safety net for those who traveled. Phoebe, whose name means radiant, was likely a Gentile. Her name comes from Greek mythology. She is called here our sister. And notice that Paul uses this familial language 
of a close nuclear family to describe this Phoebe whom the Roman believers haven't yet met. She is our sister. She is my sister, says Paul, and she is your sister, says Paul to the Roman believers. There is a warmth here of family ties in the body of Christ. And Paul says she is a servant of the church. And the word he uses here is the word for deacon. And whether she was an office-holding deacon in the church at Sancria, or whether that word has its more general sense of meaning as a servant, that by, way, by the way has been a matter of some discussion, whatever the case, she was known for her faithful service in the church. It was, she was notorious for her service. But that notoriety was unknown to the church at Rome, and so Paul commends her to the believers there. Sancria was a port city about eight miles from Corinth. It was an important place for trade. It was a, a route through which commerce went. Sancria was a city that the gospel had expanded to from Corinth. As the believers at Corinth sought to take the gospel to their surrounding regions, Sancria was one of those close neighbors. And notice verse 2, Paul says, she has been a helper of many. And the word helper here is a feminine form of the word for patron. And the Roman practice of patronage was significant. A patron was always a male. It's interesting that Paul here uses a feminine form of that word to describe Phoebe. But a patron in the Roman world was a benefactor. That was a person of wealth and a person of significant social standing who could give financial support often hospitality or even societal defense, even legal defense for people with no means and less clout. Patrons could use their name and their resources and their good standing in society to give strategic help to those they favored. Paul was a beneficiary of this benefactress, this patroness named Phoebe. No doubt Paul had received financial support and even hospitality by her sacrificial care for the gospel progress in Sancria. Paul commissions the church in Rome in verse 2 to receive her, that is to welcome her even as you would welcome the apostle Paul himself and to receive her in the Lord, that is the, according to the unity that is in Christ. And if you've traveled abroad, if you've met other believers in other places, it is remarkable the affinity that we have instantly with Christians whom we've never met. You find out that someone is a believer in Jesus Christ. You find out that someone has been rescued from his or her sins and belongs to the same Savior that you love more than life itself. And instantly there is a bond. Instantly there is a unity in the Lord. And Paul commands the church in Rome to receive her in a manner worthy of the saints. Saints is just that little word for those set apart, those belonging to God. Receive her in a manner that is worthy of those who specially belong to the Lord. And he goes on and says, help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. What might a person like Phoebe need? Someone who has significant financial resources, who herself has had a history of serving others and helping the church and opening her home. What kind of needs might she have? Well, initially in the new city, she might have need of hospitality. She might have need of meeting her own physical needs. But in all likelihood, Phoebe would be one who continues to serve the church and the progress of the gospel. And so co-laborers, co-helpers alongside of her to follow her example and carry the torch that she has carried would be a significant manner of help. It is likely that Phoebe is the one who is in fact carrying the letter personally from Paul to the Roman churches. In fact, some ancient manuscripts include an inscription that indicates that Phoebe was the letter carrier. Paul wanted the Roman Christians to know that she has Paul's support and that she should receive the help and support of the church at Rome. And so Paul includes this commendation in the letter to the church. 
Can you imagine what would happen when this letter is read publicly in the church as the church is gathered? <laughs> Receive Phoebe. Give her everything that she needs. <laughs> you can imagine how the church would respond with gratitude and eager service. The second point in this part of the letter covers verses 3 to 15. And it is a list of a series of names with the command to the churches at Rome to greet these. We're going to walk through these names and just give the scant information that is available for most of these. Uh, some of this you'll hear me say probably or likely concerning some of these because we don't always know for certain some of the details. I would hate to hang any of our conclusions on things that are uncertainties. But I do want to provide for us some background information which gives us some likely scenarios for the people mentioned here. Some things we do know for certain. Paul begins the greeting with Prissa and Aquila. Let's look at verses 3 to 5. Greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church that is in their house. Prissa is a shortened form of the name Priscilla, and Priscilla and Aquila were wife and husband. They were leather workers, they were tent makers, and at times Paul worked with them in their business. They were evidently successful because they were able, they had the means to travel from city to city in their gospel work. And they saw their role in business as a platform for their real calling in life, which was making Christ known. In fact, tent-making ministry has become a, a sort of colloquial term for laboring in the secular world to provide a means for me to really labor for the cause of the gospel. They were in Rome when Claudius expelled all Jews from Rome, and then they met Paul at Corinth. They accompanied Paul to Ephesus and stayed there for a time after Paul departed. They helped Apollos in Acts 18 understand the scriptures more accurately. They were still at Ephesus. In fact, a church was meeting in their home as Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. At some point, they went back to Rome, and as Paul then was in Corinth, he writes the letter from Corinth to the Roman church, and in this letter, he greets Priscilla and Aquila, who are there at Rome. At some later point, they move back to Ephesus, and Paul greets them there from Roman imprisonment in 2 Timothy chapter 4. It is evident that their paths have crossed with the apostle Paul many times, Notice he calls them my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. He, he doesn't primarily point to my fellow workers at making tents. <laughs> that was their occupation. But what was their life labor? What were they all about? They were laborers in the cause of Christ. Notice he says next, for my life, they risked their own necks. Now, we don't have any records specifically of the details of when Priscilla and Aquila stepped in in Paul's behalf, put their own lives on the line to rescue Paul's, perhaps the riot in Ephesus in Acts 19. But Paul expresses his gratitude for them, and he says, I'm not the only one thankful for Priscilla and Aquila, but all of the Gentile churches are thankful for them as well perhaps because they are Gentiles, or perhaps because they helped and rescued the apostle to the Gentiles, or perhaps because they labored tirelessly to take the gospel to one Gentile city after another. And maybe for all of those reasons, the Gentile churches gave thanks to them. Paul commands the Roman church to greet them. In verse 5, he also says, and greet the people who are in their house the church that meets in their home. Uh, again, they were well off by their business dealings and were able to host believers in their own home. We'll talk more about churches meeting in homes in Rome a little bit later this morning. They were well enough off that they could host and their hospitality spilled over into further progress of the gospel by being one of the several house locations for the churches at Rome. 
The next greeting comes to a man named Epinatus. Look at the end of verse 5. Greet Epinatus, my beloved, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. This is a Greek name and uh, the name given to slaves. He is most likely a freed man who uh, has acquired his freedom from former slavery. And he is called here the first convert to Christ from Asia. He would no doubt have a special place in the Apostle Paul's heart. Then in verse 6, we see, greet Mary who has worked hard for you. Mary is a Jewish name. Uh, This was probably a, a slave or a former slave. And Paul notes that she has worked hard on behalf of the believers at Rome. And then in verse 7, you have two other names, Andronicus and Junia. Andronicus is a Greek name. Junia is a Latin name. They are probably husband and wife. They are likely Hellenized Jews, and they likely have a slave background. And Paul says, they are my kinsmen. That is, they are fellow Jews. He calls them my fellow prisoners. Notice what he says in verse 7. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are outstanding among the apostles and who also were in Christ before me. When he says they were my fellow prisoners, we're, we're not certain whether they were prisoners simultaneous with Paul or if he is just showing an affinity for others who have suffered for Christ by being imprisoned. Either way, Paul knew what it was like to be on both sides of that equation. His first career was imprisoning Christians for belief in the gospel. And then Paul himself was one who was imprisoned for the cause of the gospel. And he notes that Andronicus and Junia likewise were imprisoned for the cause of Christ. It's one thing to suffer personally, but it is another thing to watch someone that you care for suffer. That is a different kind of suffering. And he resonates with their prison term in this greeting. And then notice he says they are outstanding among the apostles. This simply means that they are well known to the apostles. It doesn't mean that they are the best of the apostles. It just means in apostolic circles they were well known. They had a reputation for sacrificial, costly service to Christ. And then notice, finally, Paul says about them, they were in Christ before me. They were in Christ before me. And for Paul, that would be an interesting thought, uh, what it meant for Christians to follow Christ even when Paul was in his rebellious days antagonizing the church. We get another greeting in verse 8, this one to Ampliatus. He says, greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. This is a Latin slave name. And Paul says, he is my beloved in the Lord. Probably an indication that Paul knew Ampliatus personally and had fond affections for him. In verse 9, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. Urbanus is a Roman name that was also common among slaves and lower class. And Paul calls him our fellow worker in Christ. He points to Urbanus' labor on behalf of Jesus. And he calls him our fellow worker, Paul's fellow worker and the fellow worker with the Roman believers. Probably an indication that Paul knew him personally as well. Stachus in verse 9, and he calls Stachus my beloved. This is a Greek name also common to slaves. And it is likely that Ampliatus, Urbanus, and Stachus are the same Ampliatus, Urbanus, and Stachus who are commemorated in early church history as martyrs those who would one day give up their own lives for the cause of Christ. In verse 10, greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. Apelles is a Greek name found often in Roman imperial households, often adopted by Jews. We don't know what this Apelles background was, but if he was part of the Roman imperial household, he would have been well-educated and he would have had distinct privileges even as a servant. What Paul says about this Apelles here is that he is approved in Christ. And this word for approval means that which is tested unto approval. That is, one who has faced significant trial and has 
come through. It is possible that Apelles was known to have endured faithfully some significant trial that both demonstrated and refined his character. And then in verse 10, greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. There was an Aristobulus who was known to be a citizen of Rome who was the grandson of Herod the Great. He was part of the Herodian dynasty. And he was known to have resided in Rome and have died sometime between 45 and 49 AD, before the writing of Romans. The mention of Herodian in verse 11, a, a slave in the household of the Herodian dynasty, lends credibility to the thought that this Aristobulus is the same that is well known in Rome. It's interesting that Aristobulus is not greeted, partly because he's dead by the time this letter has come about. But the ones who are greeted are those of his household. That is, there is a, a significant band of people in the household of this high-class Roman citizen who have believed in Christ, who have begun to follow Christ. And Paul sends greetings to that household. In verse 11, we have, greet Herodian, my kinsman. Uh, Herodian is a Greek name, again, likely a, a, a Jew, he is a Jew because he's a kinsman of Paul, uh, but who has taken on the name of the Herodian family because he served in that household. And then verse 11, we have greet those of the household of Narcissus. Again, an entire household is greeted here, a, a collection of believers who are serving in a wealthy household. There was a wealthy freedman who lived in Rome named Narcissus. A freedman was one who had been a slave, who acquired his own freedom. Narcissus in Rome gave, gained his fame and gained his freedom through the downfall of the empress Messalina. She was wife of the emperor Claudius, and she had conspired against her husband, but was discovered and executed. Narcissus was the one who reported the plot to the emperor, and is ultimately the one who gave the order to run her through with a sword. Interesting history in the city of Rome, but in that household uh, was, again, a group of people who had believed in Christ. Apparently, a number of Christians there who are, as Paul says, in the Lord. And these household servants, interestingly, would have been transferred to Nero's court, but they would still have been known by the name of Narcissus. You just see how the gospel is going forward in remarkable ways through unlikely suspects into significant places in the empire, in the capital of the empire of Rome. Next in verse 12, Paul greets Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Tryphena and Tryphosa, by their name and the way they're joined together verbally, are probably sisters. These are Greek names that mean something like delicate or dainty. And what's interesting, the way Paul commends them is as workers in the Lord. Uh, they're, they're not given to such a luxuriant, dainty lifestyle that they won't get their hands dirty. No, they are laborers for the cause of Christ. In verse 12, greet Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. Persis is a female name, and it's, it means one from Persia. It's quite likely that she was a slave from Persia taken in conquest, and Paul notes of her that she has worked hard in the Lord. In verse 13, greet Rufus, a choice man, literally an elect man in the Lord. Greet Rufus. Turn to Mark 15 and verse 21. We're going to see this name, this same name show up in the gospel of Mark And while there's not a way to be 100% certain of the identity of this Rufus, I'm convinced this is the same man mentioned. Mark is likely preaching or publishing his gospel account under Peter's preaching while in Rome. And you remember the scene in Mark 15 when uh, Jesus is physically unable to carry his cross any further Mark 15, 21, the soldiers pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, 
And then in parentheses, the father, father of Alexander and Rufus to bear his cross. If Mark is publishing his gospel in Rome under Peter's preaching and adds this aside, you know who Simon of Cyrene is. You know who I'm talking about. He's Rufus's dad. He's Alexander's dad. These would have been names familiar to the Christian community at Rome. And it wouldn't be any surprise that Paul himself sends this greeting to Rufus. And if this Rufus in Romans 16 is the same as the Rufus mentioned in Mark 15, well, this is an interesting story, isn't it? That Simon of Cyrene, who was pressed into the service of carrying the physical cross for Christ, becomes a believer so that nearly a couple decades later, his family is carrying on faith in Christ who went to the cross and bore the ultimate punishment for sin. Simon may have carried Jesus' cross, but what did Jesus carry in exchange for a man like Simon? If this Rufus is the same, we may have some indication that Simon, in fact, became a believer. And then we find two sons active in the ministry for the gospel in Rome. We get another interesting indication at the conclusion of this verse. Also, his mother. Greet Rufus's mom. And what does Paul say about her? She is not only Rufus's mother, she is mine as well. Now, if the Simeon of Acts 13.1 is the same as the Simon of Cyrene, then perhaps Paul knew Simon and his wife at Antioch. Now, there's some blank space there, and that's a little bit speculative. But it would have been a significant relationship for Paul early on in his Christian life, who, according to Philippians 3, 7, and 8, considered all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus he would have forsaken his heritage, those things he had taken so much pride in. His identity was wrapped up in being a, a child of Israel, a Jew of Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin. All of those things would have been considered loss in coming to Christ. It's very likely that Paul experienced the severing of familial ties in his allegiance to Christ. Interestingly enough, a woman becomes something of a mother figure to the Apostle Paul. What a timely encouragement from the Lord and obvious affection for her on the part of the Apostle Paul, such that he sends his greetings not only to Rufus, but to Rufus's mother, who was also kind of like my mother, Paul says. In verse 14, we have greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brethren with them. We don't really know anything else about these names. Uh, perhaps the indication that these five are together with no other description of them is that Paul didn't know them personally, but knew of them by reputation. And these five, plus the brethren that meet in their house, would have composed one of the house churches in Rome. But Paul knew of them, and he knew of them by name, which indicates a, a level of concern and interest we'll talk about in a moment. In verse 15, he says, greet Philologus and Julia. Philologus and Julia, another husband-wife pair, and Philologus is a Greek name, Julia, a Latin name. These were common slave names. One early witness says that Philologus was one of the early 70 disciples of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul says in verse 15, greet Nereus and his sister. Uh, again, uh, Nereus is another Greek name common among slaves and lower class. And then greet Olympus, another Greek slave name. And the saints with them, that is the saints with Philologus and Julia, with Nereus and his sister, and with Olympus. This is perhaps another reference to one of these house churches in Rome. All these names are connected to. Why are all these names here? A list of names like this is not present in most of 
other of Paul's letters. And the other churches that Paul wrote to are churches that he planted. One indication that um, the list of names is important for a church Paul hasn't been to is perhaps the list of names at the end of the letter to Colossians. In the churches that Paul had planted, he knew most of the people there. And if he began or ended his letters with greetings to the names that he knew, that we would have longer lists of names. But here to the church at Rome, Paul is intentionally, particularly writing out these greetings to these names of people he knows. And it's remarkable how many contacts he does have in a place he's never been, in a church he's only longed to see. I think there's a second reason why all these names are here. Paul is commending the gospel that he's been preaching. In fact, the letter to the Romans is the most detailed and thorough, systematic expression of the gospel of God's grace by faith in Christ alone. And he puts it all in one place and he's sending it to them so that they have a blueprint for the very thing he plans to do as he goes through Rome in his mission to Spain. And providentially for us, we get in one letter this thorough, systematic treatment of how a sinner is right before a holy God. We get the gospel in letter form. And so Paul is commending this gospel that he's preaching and the the gospel that he's writing in this letter. But in the church at Rome who are receiving this letter are living testimonies of the power of that same gospel that Paul has been preaching That same gospel he's been proclaiming and laboring in and suffering for. That this very gospel that he's not ashamed of, that is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, Jew first and then Gentile, is already represented in the Roman community. Paul's gospel got to Rome before he did. And in listing the names of the people who had believed it and had begun living out the truths and the implications of this gospel, There is a sense in which this gospel is being preached in the lives of the people whom Paul names. So that when Paul sends this letter and they read it, and then when Paul comes to them on his way to gospel mission beyond Rome into Spain, there is already a solidarity with his message. And then a third reason why all these names are here is a solidarity of relationships built and strengthened and cultivated for Paul's partnership with the church in his coming mission to Spain. In verse 16, we have the third section of this part of the letter. And it is simply a command. Paul encourages affectionate greetings. And he does so by example and by command. Look at verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. So there's the command, greet one another with a holy kiss, and there is the example, all the churches greet you. That's an interesting statement. The the churches that Paul has been ministering in, in all the places he's gone, have sent their greetings through Paul to the church at Rome. Again, other churches who have never met believers in Rome are eager for those believers to feel a unity in fellowship, in co-laboring for the gospel amongst people they've never met. Again, it's a really remarkable thing the gospel does in transcending geography, transcending familiarity, in a unity of purpose, a unity of being in Christ together and making Christ known in the world. I've been in Russia and I've been in the Ukraine, and in every church service I've been in both of those countries... There was a section of the service that was a greeting time. Now, we stand up and greet one another. But in Russian and Ukraine churches at least 20 years ago, uh, visitors who were visiting the church from other churches in other regions would stand up in the middle of the service and say, I bring you greetings in the Lord Jesus Christ from the church at Krasnoyarsk or Novosibirsk or Moskva or wherever else they were from. And then the church would respond in unison, we greet you in the Lord. And then someone else would stand, I greet you from the churches in Los Angeles. We greet you in the Lord. And this was a regular part of their service. 
It was a really remarkable part of the service that brought a, a fondness and a unity for people beyond, in regions beyond, people whom they had never met. And this example happens right here in this letter. All the churches of Christ greet you, Roman believers. There is a warmth and a familial belonging in these greetings. Of course, in Russia and the Ukraine, they also employed the holy kiss. I'm not suggesting that we imitate that very specific cultural expression of warm, affectionate love. And maybe it's particularly in the coronavirus era. But what's enjoined in that command, the, the practice of, of a kiss as a greeting in the ancient world was common enough, but a holy kiss as set apart as those who belong to Christ, giving warm, affectionate, fond greetings to one another is an expression, a tangible expression of love. There ought to be no place for coldness in the church of Jesus Christ. There ought to be no place for the averting of eyes and the avoiding of one another in the body of Christ. In fact, just the opposite kinds of things should naturally emanate from us who have been bought with the priceless blood of Jesus Christ and have been filled by the Holy Spirit with His love shed abroad in our hearts that then leaks out all over everyone else. We ought to feel fond affections for one another. That is what Paul enjoins here. Greet one another with that holy kiss. You belong to Christ. Even if you've never met these brothers and sisters before, there is a familial warmth that comes immediately when we recognize we are in the same family in Christ. By way of contrast, I'll share a brief story from Charles Spurgeon's own life. He was 16 years old and a fairly new believer, and he went on his first Sunday to a Baptist church in Cambridge. He sat down in the pew, ungreeted. At the end of the service, he said to a man seated in the same pew, I hope you are well, sir. And the man gave him a very cold reply. <laughs> Spurgeon said, but we're brothers. He says, I don't quite know what you mean. He says, well, when I took the bread and the wine just now, in token of our being one in Christ, I meant it. Didn't you? <laughs> the man was dumbfounded. As they walked out of the church together, the man put his hands on the young Spurgeon's shoulders and he said, oh, sweet simplicity. <laughs> You young whippersnapper, that's so cute of you to actually take fellowship seriously. <laughs> the man had Spurgeon over for tea that afternoon. And then every Sunday, new, Sunday afternoon after that had him over for tea. And as Spurgeon went from there on evangelistic afternoon sharing the gospel in neighborhoods, this man went with him. They bonded and became lifelong friends. And when they were old... The man told Spurgeon, I'm rather glad you spoke to me that day, because if you'd gone to some of our deacons, I'm afraid you would not have received quite as friendly a reply as I gave you. <laughs> what kind of reception do visitors receive on a Sunday at Grace Bible Church? Do you come on a Sunday morning with your heart filled with warm affections for anyone who would name Christ? And do you just spill love all over them? Do you spend time getting to know someone you don't know? Invite them to your small group. Invite them to lunch. Invite them to your home. Invite them into your life. And just share the love that we have in Christ. That is the point of this greet one another with a holy kiss. You're greeting with fond and warm affections those whom you know in the body of Christ, who are in Christ, and you're ready to be greeted and to greet those whom you've never met who are in Christ. What do we learn from this 16-verse section in this letter? 
I think we see an example in the Apostle Paul, first of all, of warm affections, personal love, a depth of relationship for all who love Christ. Ten times in this passage, they are in the Lord or in Christ, these people that Paul greets. And that Paul greets so many by name and greets the house assemblies by the names of people in them, demonstrates warm affections, personal love from the Apostle Paul for those in the church at Rome. Secondly, we learn here that Paul had warm affections for some he had never met. If you're in Christ, I love you. Can't wait to meet you. I greet you even now. I've heard your name. And there's probably an indication here that Paul has prayed for them. Thirdly, we see in the Apostle Paul here a personal interest, a deep personal interest in the lives and activities and ministries of these people that he knows personally and those he knows of in the church. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that daily there is the burden of all the churches upon his heart. You see a glimpse of that in a positive way here. Paul knows the names, he knows the situations, he can testify personally about their co-laboring with him, those who have put their own lives on the line on his behalf, those who have given sacrificially. Paul knows, Paul is not so self-absorbed that all he can think about is himself and his needs, he's aware of others. He's aware of others' significant sacrifice for the cause of Christ around him. And he cared deeply about them. Fourthly, we learn from this list that the role of women in the early church was a vital part of the ministry of the local church. Nine women are listed here individually. No doubt there are other women implied in the groups of people described. And they are given descriptions as those who labored. A word that we get our English word copious from. It was toilsome labor on behalf of the local church. Paul calls a few of them fellow workers. That is, these women in the church were not sidelined to uh, not doing anything in the church, but they were active, laboring, giving of themselves for the ministries in the church. Fifthly, we learn from this list the role of some husband-wife teams. There are likely three husband-wife pairs in this list, and they labored together. In fact, the grammar of each of these descriptions of the husband and wife shows a very close relationship. They truly were working in tandem for the sake of Christ in the cause of the church. Sixth, we get a view into the makeup of the churches at Rome. There was a conglomeration of Jew and Gentile, Greek, Latin, Roman, and Jewish names were all present in the list. There were slaves and former slaves who were freedmen and freedwomen. There were upper class, lower class, business people, and household servants. And all of them together in Christ, with no caste or class divisions among them. Seventh, we see the structure of the church at Rome. It is likely that the wealthiest benefactors in a city could have a home that would host some 70 people. And if there were more Christians in in Rome than that, it would require multiple hosting locations in different sections of the city. Perhaps there are five such house churches represented here. Uh, Prissa and Aquila's house, the household of Aristobulus, the household of Narcissus, and then the list of names in verse 14, the five there and those who meet with them. And in verse 15, the five listed there and the brethren with them. Now, there has been in in recent years something called the house church movement, which has a similarity to the house church structure in Rome in that churches met in various households, but that's about where the similarity stops. The house church movement, by and large, is not characterized by qualified leadership, biblical preaching, church discipline, the Lord's table, and baptism but has been characterized by renegade Christians who can't get along with others and decide to have church in their living room. Now, that is a broad brush. That is not true of every church that meets in a house, but that is true of the house church movement in our country in the last couple of decades. 
and the location isn't critical. In the first three centuries of the church, churches didn't have buildings like this. A place where five or six hundred people could gather in one place for the hearing of God's word uh, was not possible. And so church gatherings had to be either out in the open in public or in smaller buildings, usually homes. But the New Testament model for the church, whether it met at Solomon's portico or whether eventually a church acquired a large property or whether they met in various homes, the New Testament parameters for what makes a church still stood. And so we have to assume that these house churches in the city of Rome were following the prescriptions for what makes a church a church. Qualified leadership, the preaching of God's word, the biblical ordinances, and on and on. But we get a picture of that even in this list that people were caring for one another and doing so by opening up their homes to host God's people for gathering. An eighth and final lesson we may learn from this list is simply that Paul was not alone in ministry. We think of him as the great apostle Paul and the apostle to the Gentiles. Well, he is no doubt a capital A apostle. He has seen the risen Christ. He performs miracles in keeping with the apostolic office. But he is not the only sent one accomplishing the expansion of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. He is not a solo lobo, a lone wolf or a lone ranger missionary. But in this list, you see people in every city, laboring with him, working with him, sacrificing on his behalf, patronesses, benefactors, hosts, fellow workers, businessmen, slaves, fellow prisoners. Paul is dependent and relational. He's not on his own, doing things according to his own desires, but he has a whole host of people in a whole swath of cities, in church after church after church, laboring with him in the cause of the gospel. Think about our friends in Papua New Guinea. Uh, there's a new pile of stickers on the back table that says 49 left. The stickers used to say 50 left, but the gospel has now been preached and perhaps believed, been believed by some in Maui Roro. And so there is one less language group in the Finister Mountains that has not heard the gospel. And we praise God for that. And this number 49 kind of stares at us, does it not? Maybe God would raise up more to go and do even as the Apostle Paul did and so many others in this list to take the gospel where it had not been known. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this list of names these very real people in real places, in real churches, suffering real trials and giving up real finances, loving one another in real relationship. We thank you for the example this is to our own hearts. As we think about our own lives, they truly are not ours. Uh, they are yours having been bought with a price and we are members of one another in your church, that organism that you have designed to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Oh God, we pray to be faithful in emptying ourselves for the benefit of one another, truly loving one another with holy affections and familial fondness as we walk together, arm in arm, heart to heart, taking your gospel to those who have never heard. We ask that you'd help us be the church in Jesus' name, amen.